Good afternoon, and welcome to the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation's Meet the Scientists monthly webinar series. I'm Dr. Jeff Borenstein, President and CEO of the Foundation, and your host and moderator for today's webinar. Today, Dr. Jacqueline Crawley will present Autism, Understanding the Causes and Developing Effective Treatments. The Brain and Behavior Research Foundation is committed to alleviating the suffering caused by mental illness by awarding grants that will lead to advances and breakthroughs in scientific research. The foundation is the largest private funder of mental health research grants. Since 1987, the foundation has awarded more than $346 million. 100% of all donor contributions for research are invested in grants to scientists who are working to find breakthroughs in disorders such as addiction, ADHD, anxiety, autism, bipolar disorder, borderline personality disorder, depression, OCD, PTSD, and schizophrenia. I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Jacqueline Crawley. Dr. Crawley is the Robert E. Chasen Chair in Translational Research at the Mind Institute and a professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at the University of California Davis School of Medicine in Sacramento. And Dr. Crawley is a member of the Foundation's Scientific Council. The Council selects the most promising ideas to fund with Foundation grants. Today's webinar will begin with Dr. Crowley's presentation. This will be followed by a question and answer period. To submit your questions, please use the questions tab on the control panel on your screen. Feel free to submit your questions throughout the presentation. Following the presentation, I'll present your questions to Dr. Crowley and will address as many as possible in the time allotted. And now, I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Jacqueline Crowley. Jackie, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jeff, and the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation for today's opportunity to describe current approaches uh, to discovering medical treatments for autism. Autism spectrum disorder is a neurodevelopmental disorder, which means it begins at a very young age and continues through life. The prevalence is currently estimated as greater than 1% of the population, which is quite high of people who have an autism spectrum disorder. The primary reason for the apparent increase in the number of cases of autism is improved diagnosis. So we've only had a, a textbook definition of autism for about 20 years. And the uh, consciousness in the public and pediatricians, teachers, and family members really has grown just over the past few years. There may be other reasons, but primarily we've had much better diagnosis and appreciation of the symptoms of autism as a specific disorder. Uh, just to be clear, there's absolutely zero scientific evidence that vaccines cause autism. Vaccines do not cause autism. Uh, this is a disorder that is behaviorally defined. And I'd like to tell you a little bit about the symptoms to start us off. So there are two categories of diagnostic symptoms. The first is unusual reciprocal social interactions and social communication. Uh, this presents as a lack of eye contact, lack of joint attention, paying attention to what other people are doing, and in ways, lack of empathy for other people's thinking and feelings. This is a cartoon taken from the work of Lorna Wing in London. Uh, Dr. Wing was a psychiatrist who had a ch child with autism. And uh, from her daughter's uh, presentation, she became interested in studying more about autism and basically identified these three different types, uh, subtypes of social deficits. The one you might have heard about as the classic in the literature is the aloof child who doesn't interact with others and doesn't approach others and just stays by themselves. And there are people like this with autism. The second is uh, called the passive. These are children or adults who don't mind being with others, but generally don't initiate social interactions. 
The third, which turns out to be much more common, which uh, Lorna Wing called the odd, is uh, just inappropriate social interactions and inappropriate responses to social cues. So this is a, a child coming up to a stranger in the park and touching her hair and sniffing her. And this is sort of the um, underlying concept behind uh, it not being able to uh, interact in ways that are considered within the normal standards. The second half of the first diagnostic symptom, deficits in social communication, often presents as delays in beginning to speak, very concrete use of words rather than having the sarcasm and humor that is part of most people's uh, vocabularies, an absence of the nuances within a sentence or the prosody, the melodies and rhythms that make up most people uh, speaking, more talking in monotones, and lack of interactive conversations, rather talking in a monologue about the person with autism's uh, special interest. There's also this inability to interpret facial expressions and body language, which is a big part of our social communication. And uh, this leads to an impairment in the ability to really understand what other people are thinking and what their intentions are, which has been called theory of mind or mentalization or mind blindness. The second diagnostic symptom includes a, uh, several different behaviors that are all in the repetitive domain. These could be motor stereotypies, such as flapping of the hands or walking on the toes, uh, repetitive uh, performance of one toy or game or task over and over, so always doing the same jigsaw puzzle many times in a row or only playing with one video game. Um, this can uh, escalate into a very strong insistence on sameness to a very specific routine in daily meals or TV shows or how we drive to school in the morning. Um, and sometimes very strong interest in something that could be quite fascinating to many people, including statistics of sports or uh, the New York subway system or elements of the chemical periodic table in which the person with autism becomes really expert in one thing that they find fascinating. And sometimes this leads to quite remarkable special abilities in mathematics or music. Um, many people with autism have very successful careers in their special interest. A lot of computer programming at our MIND Institute in Sacramento, all of the art on the walls has been done by people with autism. It's really lovely work. There are also associated symptoms of autism that occur in some but not all people, and these include intellectual impairments, anxiety, seizures, unusual sensitivity to sensory stimuli, such as the sudden loud noise of a vacuum cleaner, or avoiding certain uh, textures of clothes or tastes of food, uh, hyperactivity, ADHD, attentional deficit hyperactivity disorder, appears in some people with autism. A lot of sleep disruption, which is very difficult for the families. Uh, so we have this group of symptoms that are appearing as the definition of the uh, syndrome, and then these associated symptoms that appear in some cases. So we really, at this point, are in the stages of understanding what the causes of autism are. And for sure, there is not a single cause. There are multiple causes that have been implicated, and investigators all over the world are addressing different hypotheses about the causes of autism. Some of these hypotheses concern environmental factors. However, at this point, the strongest evidence is genetic. And that comes from two sources. One is that if uh, there are two identical twins one of whom has autism, there's a very high possibility that the other has autism. The concordance is up to 90% or so that uh, if one has autism, the other identical twin has autism. And that's as compared to about 10% concordance between fraternal twins and siblings. And so that dif differential is what makes you think that we're looking for genetic causes. There's also a four to one ratio or, or higher of boys having autism as compared to girls, which makes us think that maybe we should be looking at genes on the X and Y chromosomes or associated with genes on those chromosomes. 
So as you can imagine, there's been a very wide search all over the world with major international consortia trying to discover what the genetic causes of autism actually are. Immediately, the information became quite apparent that this is not a single gene disorder, like Huntington's disease, in which there's one gene that causes that disease. In fact, there's been quite a large number of genes that are now implicated in autism. Some are deletions of segments of chromosomes with many genes in the region of the, on the 15 chromosome 15, chromosome 16, chromosome 22, or the X-linked chromosome 23. Uh, there's some that are factors during uh, formation and expression of DNA uh, and RNA and proteins. There are some that are single genes that occur de novo, that is the parent does not have this mutation and it's just a mutation that occurs later uh, in the egg or in the sperm or the early emb embryo. And those are the most common in autism. Some of these are genes that work through synapses, the connections between uh, two neurons in the brain. Some are related to neurotransmitters, the chemicals that uh, transmit information in the brain. Uh, some are involved in early brain development. And some are genes that we know about from other dis neurodevelopmental disorders, such as Fragile X mental re uh, syndrome of intellectual impairments, Rett syndrome, tuberous sclerosis, in which some percentage of these people also have autism. So we have a lot of clues about different genes that might be causing autism. And the question is, how do you get to a single syndrome from all of these different avenues, all of these different types of genetic mutations? So to understand which of these genetic mutations contribute, which contributes strongly versus weakly, and to which of those different symptoms of autism, there's been various approaches that scientists have used. The standard strategy in biomedical research is to generate a mouse model that has the same genetic mutation and then to investigate what the outcomes are in that mouse and to try to understand what the outcomes, the consequences are of having that mutation. And luckily, quite a large number of mouse models have been generated for many of the genes that have been implicated in autism. We now do have very good mouse models. So that leads us to the fundamental questions of how we look into these risk genes for autism that might be coding for, for example, synaptic proteins that form connections between neurons in the brain. Our hypothesis then is that the mutant mouse model will display features relevant to the symptoms of autism. And the approaches would be to then look at the behaviors of the mice and neuroanatomy and physiology and biochemistry of the mice to understand their phenotypes, their uh, features that would be relevant to the symptoms of autism in that specific mutation. So in terms of behavioral phenotyping, which is what our lab does, we have this quite intriguing question of how would you model these uniquely human behavioral symptoms of autism in mice? So our lab had worked on mouse models of many other neuropsychiatric disorders over the years, schizophrenia, depression, anxiety, Alzheimer's, feeding disorders. And we knew a lot about mouse behaviors, but we didn't know the types of specific social deficits seen in autism or communication problems or repetitive behaviors uh, didn't really have assays, tasks, methods in mice to test for them. What would you look at in mice that would be relevant to those symptoms? We understand very clearly this is a human disorder with very human symptoms, and we never use this term. We try not to anthropomorphize, but rather we are generating mouse behavioral assays that have some conceptual analogy, face validity to the symptoms of autism. And we're using these to look at um, models with construct validity to test hypotheses about causes, for instance, a genetic mutation or an environmental factor. So we have these genetic mutations that have been discovered in people with autism as one construct. The environmental causes could be, for example, parental age, older parents often have an increased risk for having a child with autism. Some information about autoantibody disorders, environmental toxins have been investigated using mouse models. 
And the idea is that if you have a robust mouse model with good face validity based on your specific hypothesized construct, those then become translational tools to use to look for treatments, to evalu evaluate potential therapeutic efficacy of treatments for autism. This is called preclinical research. So how do we get started in finding the right behavioral assays for mouse models of autism? So the way we start is we talk to the clinical experts. And we've been very fortunate and have great gratitude to some of these excellent autism clinical researchers who let us understand the symptoms by uh, seeing what they look like in real life or from videos or at conferences, and then looking at what mice do, the different behaviors in the social domains and repetitive behaviors that, that mice exhibit, and giving us a guidance on which are close enough, might be analogous, might have face validity to the human symptoms of autism. And we've luckily been able to get some of those mutant lines of mice from our colleagues who generate them in their genetics labs. We do the behavioral testing across the developmental trajectory starting at very young ages to adulthood. And then we and our collaborators then use those mice to investigate what might be the biological mechanisms, what's going wrong biologically in the mice with those mutations, and then use those behavioral and biological phenotypes to see what therapeutic interventions might reverse the symptoms in mice and might potentially point the way towards uh, treatments that might be worth a clinical trial in humans with autism. So that's our general strategy. So what are the tests that we came up with with this strategy? Well, uh, we look for what mice do in the social domain, and we observe and score the detailed parameters of their reciprocal social interaction. So mice follow each other. They do a lot of nose-to-nose -nose sniffing, sort of a greeting response, nose to anogenital genital sniffing like your dogs might do when they meet somebody new in the dog world. Uh, they groom each other. Uh, they do a lot of physical contact when they're pushing past each other and when they're crawling over and under each other. And we score these uh, with videos in which you're watching the mouse. The videotape is running, and we, we have these videos of mice following and physically contacting each other and sniffing each other. And uh, have software that measures these different parameters. And for example, this is a very standard strain of mice, B6, C57 black B6, that shows a lot of nose-to-nose -nose sniffs. And this is one of our inbred strain mouse models of autism BTBR that shows a lot less nose-to-nose -nose sniffs. This is a mutant line shank 3 b one of the mutant mutations seen in autism, in which their normal controls, their litter mates who don't have the mutation, the wild types, show a lot of following each other. And in contrast, the mutant lines, the knockout mice, don't follow each other as much in terms of time spent following and number of bouts, number of occasions of following. Sniff time, again, would be less in the shank 3 knockouts than their wild type litter mate controls. So that's the kind of fine grain scoring that we can get a lot of information that might be relevant to the kinds of reciprocal interactions that might be going uh, that might be appearing less in people with autism. But it's very slow going to score these videos. And so we thought it was important to develop a higher throughput assay that was more automated. And so uh, in concert again with these clinical experts' advice, we developed a task in which the subject mouse starts in the middle chamber and has a choice of coming over here and spending time exploring a toy. This is an inverted wire pencil cup that has features that mice find interesting or coming to the other side chamber where there's an identical cup as a control, but inside is a novel mouse that the subject has never met before. And most mice are very interested in both the toy and in the other novel mouse, but spend more time over here with the novel mouse than over here with the novel object. That's our simple automated sociability uh, definition. There's photo cells across the opening and software that measures when the mouse breaks the photo beams in terms of time spent in the chamber and moving back and forth. And uh, the idea here came from children in classrooms and in playgrounds in which most of the kids are playing with each other and the child with autism is off playing with its favorite toy. And so if the 
uh, mouse is not spending more time with the novel mouse than with the novel object, we consider that as a failure in sociability. And that's just, and here's an example of our BTBR inbred strain in which they do move around fine. They don't have any physical problems, but they spend about the same amount of time with the novel object as with the novel mouse. And so if you like to look at data, which is the output measures we use, in red is time spent with the novel mouse, in green is time spent with the novel object, in white is time spent in the chamber, which is our control that they're physically getting up and moving around all right. And the B6 mice, the control strain, spends more time with the novel mouse than object, and the BTBR spends about equal time failing the sociability test. And that's a simple automated 10-minute test, which is high enough throughput to try to look for treatments that take a lot of mice and a lot of time to evaluate. The social communication is a bigger problem for mice because obviously they can't study language. Mice mostly communicate with olfactory pheromones. They do emit vocalizations. They're in the ultrasonic range, which your cat or dog could hear, but we can't hear. Uh, but we now have specialized uh, ways to look at vocalizations. And in the olfactory domain, we have specialized ways to see whether the mouse is interested in sniffing different odors. So we put social odors on this uh, cotton tip swab and measure the time the mouse spent sniffing to see whether it has an interest in the normal response to sniffing social odors from other mice. And for the vocalizations, we put two mice together. This might be a male with a female and we have a video camera recording their interactions. And this is the ultrasonic microphone that's picking up their calls emitted during those interactions. So for example, this is a male sniffing uh, female pheromones in female urine. And uh, these are the tracings of the calls that the software gives us. And I'll play for you what some of these calls sound like. And I'm gonna put the microphone, the my phone very close to the, uh, speaker here. I hope you'll be able to hear these just a moment. So I hope that was loud enough. These are uh, sort of complex calls and when we slow them down to our hearing range they sound a lot like bird song to many people which birds do use these calls for communication. We don't know for sure that mice are actually communicating anything to the other animal, uh, but we do know that these are calls admitted in response to social cues by being in the presence of another animal and interacting. So, uh, and we have found that, for example, the normal B6 mice do a lot of interacting and a lot of vocalizations over time together, whereas the BTBR mice do not. They're not socially interacting and they're not calling. So these vocalizations may be a good marker for the kinds of emissions that mice make in the vocal arena during social interactions. And for another example, here's the Shank 3 mouse. Uh, it's wild type normal controls with no mutation doing a lot of calls and with the mutation doing a lot less calls. The second diagnostic category we've been able to model much more easily in mice. Mice do display some spontaneous motor stereotypies, such as uh, running around in circles, jumping up in the air, back flipping. Uh, they do some repetitive behaviors like grooming themselves for very long periods of time, or digging in the litter, or burying something like marbles that are placed in their cages excessively. And we've been able to model the kind of insistence on sameness, the sticking to routines, by teaching mice to locate an uh, uh, escape platform in a tea maze or a water maze, and then change after they've learned the location of that escape route, changing to a different escape route and seeing if they have the flexibility to uh, learn a new location uh, which has a re reward at the end. So these are various ways to look at uh, the second diagnostic category in mice in the repetitive domain. So for example, here is what the high levels of self-grooming look like. Most mice will do the normal housekeeping grooming to keep their fur clean for a few seconds. But this is uh, the BTBR, or the Shank 3 mouse, that grooms on and on and on for like a minute or longer. And that's what we would call a repetitive behavior, the normal pattern. It's just very extended in time. 
So here's the shank three bee mice, their wild type controls, doing a little bit of grooming, but the shank three mutants doing lots of grooming, and that's both in the males and in the females, and a lot, very significantly higher when we put them together. We also have assays for all of these associated symptoms of autism. And uh, in the restrictions of time, I won't show you pictures of these, but we can assay cognitive abilities, anxiety-related behaviors, measure seizures, measure sensory responses, activity levels, and sleep in mice. And so these can all be done within a mouse model to uh, see whether some of the other phenotypes relevant to some of the symptoms of autism might appear as a result of the mutation. So now we've got pretty good assays that we feel fairly confident are relevant to the symptoms of autism, and we've got many different mutant lines of mice, and also mice who've been treated with factors that might be considered environmental. And the question is then, how do we approach the treatment efficacy for developing therapeutics for autism using these mouse models? So when I first started thinking about autism and getting into the field, which is now about 15 years ago, we all assumed that it was too late once the child was born and the autism diagnosis was in place by ages two, three, four, five years old, the brain problems were fixed and there's really nothing that could be done medically. However, once we started discovering that many of these mutations were in synaptic genes that code for proteins that form synapses between neurons in the brain, we realized that it might not be too late for interventions. In fact, synapses are forming all the time. You're forming new synapses right now when you're listening to this talk. And so uh, one could, and we have many drugs that work through synaptic mechanisms. And so maybe one could develop treatments based on compounds that work through synaptic functions. And so we've begun to look at pharmacological targets for neurodevelopmental disorders based on this concept. So for example, here is one neuron, and here is another neuron, and here is the synapse, the area between the end of neuron one and the beginning of neuron two. This is called the axon, uh, in which neuron one is sending out its projections to link up with the dendrite at the, end, at the beginning of neuron two. And neurotransmitters, chemical transmitters, cross that space, the gap, the synaptic gap, uh, to uh, turn on receptors in the postsynaptic dendrites that then uh, relay that signal down to the cell of neuron 2, which then does the same thing along the line to neuron 3 and neuron 4, and that's synaptic transmission. So what we have is a lot of known neurotransmitters, glutamate, GABA, serotonin, dopamine, oxytocin, and many others that could be released from, in various cases, in the first neuron and initiate this postsynaptic density effect downstream that work through many downstream mechanisms that uh, we know a lot about, including uh, MAP kinase pathways, mTOR pathways, and some of these cell adhesion proteins that form the strengthening of the synapses. And the good news is that we have drugs that intervene at each of these places. So we have compounds that work through the glutamate receptors, through the GABA receptors, uh, GABA drugs that might be replacing low GABA or increasing uh, low levels of other neurotransmitters. And we also have compounds that have been developed for cl other clinical purposes that work through some of these downstream signaling pathways through the mTOR pathway or PI3 kinase pathway. So in fact, we have a good set of pharmacological tools to try to replace missing transmitters or enhance transmitters that might be at low levels or inhibit transmitters that might be at too high a level or uh, increase or decrease these downstream signaling pathways. So the initial investigations uh, in the field of mouse models of autism have been addressing, using this concept to address the excitatory inhibitory imbalance hypothesis of autism. This came from the concept that there might be too much excitatory glutamatergic transmission because many people with autism have seizures. Uh, they might be having those seizures because of excess glutamate and many of the mouse models of autism turned out to have excess glutamatergic transmission. 
Similarly, many of the mutations that have been discovered turned out to have not enough inhibition, not enough of the GABA inhibitory neurotransmitter. So there might be this imbalance, too much excitation, too little inhibition in many cases that could be ameliorated, could be treated with drugs that work through glutamate and GABA mechanisms. So that's the current hypothesis in our lab and several others have been trying some of the compounds that intervene through the glutamate and GABA receptors. The first one we tried was a compound, an mGluR5 antagonist, which is uh, in, basically inhibits the total glutamate excitatory output of neurons in the brain. Uh, this is a paper that uh, came out in Science Translational Medicine in 2012. And it was a collaboration with a team at Pfizer. It was unfunded, but I did want to declare that these were scientific collaborators who contributed to the experiments in this paper. And basically, Pfizer provided the compound, and their scientists did some of the experiments, and we did some of the other experiments without any funding. So uh, this is the level of self-grooming in the control B6 line and very high self-grooming in the BTBR line. And this is this mGluR5 uh, antagonist reducing the amount of self-grooming in the BTBR. And what I think is very important to emphasize is that one wants to see a finding once, and then you want to see it again, and then you want to see it again. This is three different groups of BTBR mice, each time showing a good decrease in this repetitive self-grooming. You really want to replicate findings in general in science, but specifically in drug treatments to be sure that this is a very solid finding before considering it for a clinical investigation. We then went ahead with the same compound using another inbred strain of mice, C58J, that has a motor stereotypy. They do a lot of vertical jumping. And so here's the high level of jumping in C58 mice. At the same doses, the same compound reduced vertical jumping in the C58 mice. So that's two behaviors in the repetitive domain that were uh, reduced by this drug treatment. In the so and we also want to make sure that the drug is simply not sedating the mice, that they're not just sleeping at the bottom of the cage. So we check their total activity. And in fact, uh, this compound was not producing sedation. Uh, no drug, the vehicle treatment, uh, and the three doses that we used all gave the same amount of activity. We then went on and looked at the social deficits in this BTBR strain. So here's the B6 mouse showing more time with a novel mouse than with a novel object at any dose of drug. Here's the BTBR mouse not showing the normal sociability. But in fact, treatment with this compound, with this mGluR5 compound, restored sociability in the B6 mouse. I'm sorry, in the BTBR mouse. So now the BTBRs are showing significant sociability. In the reciprocal social interactions, when we're looking at two freely moving interacting mice, again, the B6 does a lot of nose-to-nose -nose sniffing, a lot of social contact, and the BTBR does a lot less as compared to B6. And the drug treatment at doses that worked in the other assays improved the time spent in nose-to-nose -nose sniffing and in social contact in the BTBR. As and again, uh, we did yet a fourth cohort and again saw the reduction in grooming and yet another repetitive behavior digging in the litter in the, in the uh, bottom of the cage was reduced by uh, this compound. So it seems quite remarkable, at least to us, that one compound might be effectively changing and improving performance on behaviors in mice in both the social and the repetitive domain. And therefore, we would think that perhaps this compound really is acting on some fundamental biological abnormality in these mice. And we know that the BTPR have low GABA inhibition from work of two other groups. And uh, that still needs to be verified in various brain regions. But there is enough information that inhibitory transmission is low in BTBR to lead us to think that we were correcting that fundamental inhibitory loss by reducing the excitatory uh, levels to restore the excitatory inhibitory balance. We've then done one other published study 
using the other side of the coin, which is to give a GABA agonist to increase the inhibitory transmission. This is a compound called r which works at the GABA-B receptor to increase its inhibitory function. And so here we have, again, B6 mice with some low levels of self-grooming, BTBR with more self-grooming, and this uh, GABA agonist reducing the self-grooming in BTBR, also reducing them digging in the litter and covering up marbles that are placed in the cage. And again, here's the C58 mouse showing reduced stereotyped jumping with this r in treatment. In the social, social domain, again, here's the BTBR not showing significant sociability on a saline vehicle, uh, no, no drug treatment, but showing restored sociability uh, with these uh, doses of the r treatment, both on time they spent in the chamber and time they spent sniffing the other mouse. And our control measure of are they moving back and forth between chambers showed this was not a sedating dose, so they're still showing normal exploratory behaviors. So I've just shown you two different compounds that our lab has worked on, one that reduces glutamatergic excitation, the other that increases GABAergic inhibition. So these are two very strong strategies that uh, we and other labs are pursuing. There have been several other drug treatment strategies that are uh, published and some that are ongoing in several other labs. So I just wanted to mention a few examples from recent publications. Uh, so uh, a group at Novartis had a paper in Science Magazine this year on an inhibitor that reversed some of the deficits in shank 3 mice. Um, oxytocin treatment reversed some of the deficits in the catnap 2 mice in a paper from Dan Geschman's lab at UCLA last year. Um, Joseph Buxbaum at Mount Sinai and Dr. Sur at MIT have been trying an uh, IGF-1, a growth factor, that seems to reverse some of the electrophysiological and behavioral phenotypes in the Shank-3A mice and in the Rett syndrome MECB2 mice. And uh, then Eric Klan's lab at New York University has been looking at ERB inhibitors in UBE3 Angelman's mice. So these are various kinds of mouse models, some of which are specific for autism, some of which are these comorbid syndromes in which there are features of autism present, using various pharmacological strategies showing beneficial effects. So I just am trying to emphasize that there are many different potential pharmacological targets that are currently under investigation. There have been very short, uh, initial clinical trials for some of these compounds, and some of them that are in progress right now for people with Fragile X syndrome and for people with autism, and for people with Fragile X who also have autism. Uh, the ones that have been tried so far include an r baclofen study uh, through Seaside Therapeutics with Fragile X and for the combination and with autism alone. And so far, the data have turned out to be negative. And those are negative findings on the primary outcome measure, the single outcome parameter that was chosen for the FDA-approved trial, I mean, for, uh, for FDA potential approval based on that tr data from that trial. In fact, when one goes through the rest of the measures that were tested in these trials, there were many positive findings, and some were in the social domains. So the question is, why did this initial trial fail? And there, you know, by definition, that its primary outcome measure was not significant, significantly improved. And probably this has to do with the experimental design. We're just at the very early stages of thinking about how to design experiments for neurodevelopmental disorder trials. And so some of the issues are, what is the right primary outcome measure? Uh, should you be choosing subsets of people with the syndrome, perhaps a certain level of IQ, a certain level of language skills, uh, what age should you be testing, uh, how long, what dose should you be used, how long should you be administering that dose. Um, so these are all questions that really will require more clinical trials to work out. But as you know, clinical trials are very laborious and time consuming and very expensive. So companies are appropriately risk aversive about beginning these clinical trials for autism. And that's perfectly understandable, um, but 
what our lab has been thinking about are ways to sort of de-risk the development of autism therapeutics to try to keep companies interested and willing to go ahead and try to develop compounds, maybe compounds that they may already have available as potential new treatments for autism and other neurodevelopmental disorders. So we've begun a consortium supported by Autism Speaks uh, called the Preclinical Autism Consortium for Therapeutics, PACT, that's designed to evaluate a range of different pharmacological targets and to uh, ensure very high reproducibility of our preclinical findings by doing at least two replications of each study that we try. And we've looked at this in terms of using two different species, both mouse genetic models of autism and newly available rat genetic models of autism, to make sure that we're not focusing on a drug's effect that's only specific to something about mice. At least we have two different species that might give some confidence that the findings will generalize to other species, including humans. So from our lab's point of view, we've been doing 10 different behavioral assays relevant to social and repetitive behaviors and some of the associated symptoms of autism replicated in two cohorts. And then in concert, the other consortium members are working through electrophysiological assays using physiological phenotypes that have been seen in some people with autism and some of the mouse models, again replicated in two cohorts. And so the physiological, where they're doing the behavioral portion in mice, the physiological components are being done by Mustafa Sahin at Boston Children's Hospital, and Carrie Jones at Vanderbilt University is working on the new genetic rat models. Uh, and our uh, former coordinator at Autism Speaks was Dan Smith. So again, the idea here, the reason I'm mentioning our consortium, is that there is this great need to try to reduce risk and increase the industry investment in autism drug discovery based on preclinical targets that could be providing a validation for novel autism medicine. So um, the real question is what are the most compelling mouse models and the relevant assays to investigate these hypothesis-driven pharmacological targets? We're now beginning partnerships with companies that have compounds that we think are interesting. So this is uh, by way of trying to uh, give you a flavor for the long, laborious process it takes to first understand some of the causes of autism, second, develop model systems in which one can investigate the hypotheses cause, hypothesized causes by looking at the outcomes, the phenotypic consequences of those mutations, and then using those models in a very hypothesis-driven, rigorous, reproducible way to look for therapeutics that might reverse the symptoms of mice and might therefore be potential uh, candidates for human clinical trials. So I'd like to thank uh, the supporters of our research, uh, the UC Davis Mind Institute in Sacramento, Autism Speaks, the Simons Foundation Autism Research Initiative, uh, NID, NDS at NIH, and uh, National Institute of Mental Health, where we had been for many years before moving out here to Sacramento for their support and patience in the long process it takes to get to the point of testing preclinical mouse models, and to thank all the terrific people in our lab who've contributed to these experiments that I've just shown you, and to conclude by our basically uh, optimistic understanding that behavioral interventions are currently the standard of care for the treatment of multiple symptoms of autism. And early behavioral interventions have been very useful for many people with autism in terms of bringing their lifestyles closer to uh, what is more standard for children and for adults and allowing more uh, traditional lifestyles. So early behavioral intervention is definitely the important thing to concentrate on right now. But we are cautious, cautiously optimistic that systematic investigations of multiple pharmacological targets of behavioral and biological phenotypes in genetic mouse models combined with behavioral interventions will be uh, able to discover effective medical treatments that will further increase the value of the early behavioral interventions and perhaps treat the fundamental deficits causing autism and really provide cures. So thank you very much for your attention. Uh Jackie, thank you very much, first of all, for the work that you've done on this and for just an extraordinary presentation. 
And I think you did a great job showing the relationship between very basic research, um, then research on animal models, how to develop and make use of those models, and then how that could relate to uh, clinical trials in, in, in people. Um, so I want to start off just by um, focusing a little bit on what you emphasized in terms of the, the fact that um, given our early understanding of some of the issues at the synaptic level, the potential for medicine, other interventions to really make a difference. Um, and there are a couple of people asking about that um, and just sort of uh, want to get a sense from you in terms of a potential timeline um, to develop medicines that may be helpful for people. Yes, so this is obviously a critical question. How long do these studies take before we have something that can be available as a treatment? Um, one of the good news components of the answer is that many of the compounds that, compo that companies have available have already been through safety testing for other disorders. So some of these drugs have been used to treat epilepsy or to try to treat schizophrenia or uh, other psychiatric disorders. And so the long time, the number of years it takes to do the safety testing may be uh, truncated because that information is already available. In terms of the preclinical work, it takes us about one year to fully test a drug in appropriate mouse models with replications. And I think it's this, we're in parallel with our collaborators in the PASH consortium. It takes Mustafa Sahin about the same amount of time or maybe a little bit less to do the physiology experiments. So we can know in about a year whether it looks promising uh, enough from our mouse studies to consider a compound as potentially useful clinically. And then it's really uh, a matter of assembling the resources it takes to do a clinical trial from recruiting patients to finding the funding to developing an infrastructure for designing the experiments, uh, developing the protocols, and uh, then just running the experiments. And usually uh, initial clinical trials take a couple of years, maybe up to five years. And then there's the phase one going to the FDA of the safety. Again, that could be somewhat shortened. The phase two, doing a larger study for efficacy. The phase three, doing uh, multi-site studies with larger numbers of people. And so phase three is when families can offer to uh, can, to be part of a clinical trial. And if the trial turns out to be successful, then the compound becomes available generally through uh, general physicians. And this is a process that can take anywhere from five years to ten years, depending on how successful the, the trials are. So we don't want to mislead the audience by thinking that any of these compounds are going to become clinically available tomorrow, but they might become available within uh, the adolescence of a child who's, become, who's been diagnosed with autism uh, in the past couple of years. One of the, one of the uh, questions relates to the timing of the interventions, and as you said, and as people are aware, early intervention in terms of the behavioral approaches is, is extremely important. Do you have a sense of, w with regards to the use of medicine, um, how important early is versus, you know, at any point in the person's life receiving the medicine? That is such an important question. And we, we think about this a lot. We've been testing our compounds in mouse models, mostly in adults but we also have juvenile social interaction tests that we can use to see uh, whether we get a better effect if we give a drug treatment at a very early age. If so, then it's really important to give the drug treatments early in the development of the disorder to children. And certainly that is what everybody's thinking is right now, that the earlier you intervene, the better. On the other hand, we have the problem that uh, you don't want to risk a new drug treatment in young children, uh, which could have various side effects that we don't know about yet. So the Food and Drug Administration mostly wants us to start testing compounds in adults. 
or older adolescents, maybe 18 to 25 year olds. So probably the first clinical trials will not be done in children, but if they prove promising in older uh, adolescents and young adults, I think then there will be a big push to try to get permission to test in younger children and see if the earliest interventions really are the most effective in changing the entire trajectory of the, the person's life. Right. Well, that's obviously the goal across the board, both helping people who are older and, and helping the younger. Uh, what, one um, area that you, you, you mentioned is the, the issue of biomarkers and that we don't yet have a, a clear biomarker which would help us make a determination earlier, as early as possible um, in a child. Where are we in terms of this research and how that relates to developing a biomarker so we can make the diagnosis even earlier for children? Yes, so exactly right. Biomarkers mean something biological that you can say this is a clear indication the person has this disease and if you give a treatment, the biomarker should be restored to normal as a clear indication that the treatment worked. So an example is testing glucose levels in the blood for people with diabetes. Um, unfortunately, we don't have anything like that that's simple and straightforward and works every time for autism. But there are many efforts ongoing both in terms of imaging of the brain to look at brain regions that are not as active during social interactions, to uh, EEG signatures that might reflect unusual brain uh, activity patterns. So for example, our PACT consortium collaborator Mustafa Sahin uh, has been looking at the EEG literature in autism and recognizing certain frequencies of uh, EEG waves that might be unusual in humans that he's also seeing unusual in some of the mouse models. And EEG can be done in awake behaving people and animals, it's not invasive. Uh, so that's probably uh, one of the larger, larger findings so far, raising the hopes that maybe EEG signatures would be interesting biomarkers. Um, there's lots of approaches being used and I think we're at, at fairly early stages in the science literature right now to know which of them are going to work out as strong biomarkers. It's possible that we'll end up with subsets of people. We'll have a group of people with mutations that are working through GABA mechanisms and we'll be able to look at inhibitory processes uh, that are biomarkers for that subset. And another subset that's working in which the mutation is working through a brain developmental process and we'll be able to see the biomarker in terms of uh, imaging the brain with uh, MRI scans and treatments might be developed specifically for that subset based on their, their biological problems. So uh, this is an evolving field. There's a big biomarker consortium uh, that a lot of foundations and a lot of universities and NIH has been investing in. And uh, just stay tuned. We hope we'll have some good answers for you soon. Right, right. I, the one approach that some people uh, look at is the issue of diet. And I'm wondering if you have any information about any approaches with diet that could be helpful in some of the symptoms of autism. And if so, how that might relate to some of these basic science questions that you're looking at. Yes, so there's quite a large uh, and growing body of information about the gut microbiome, uh, the various bacteria in the gut, that each person seems to have its own, his, his or her own constellation of uh, bacterial makeup of their gut. And some of these may be involved in the causes of some allergies, the causes of uh, problems with digestion food, and the causes of some gastrointestinal syndrome. So there's now a lot of research going on about whether children with autism who have gastrointestinal distress might have unusual microbiome. There are lots of families who say that their children with autism have a lot of gastrointestinal problems. And we don't really know the percentage, you know, what percentage of kids or adults with autism have GI problems. Uh, there's a lot of papers out in literature and each time there's a new paper published the percentages vary. And we don't know for sure that this is endemic to the disorder versus caused by 
the children having very picky eating habits or you know, not eating as many fruits and vegetables as it might take to have good uh, bowel uh, functions. Uh, we don't know for sure what exactly the GI problems are in each case, but certainly many families have tried special diets and have tried gluten-free diets or um, various types of um, vegan or, or vegetarian diets or you know, various other approaches that they say work very well for their child. And I think that's fantastic. And uh, if it works, you know, that's, that's just all you need to know in, for your own child and your own family. Um, whether these diets should be used more generally for everybody with autism, I think that's pretty much an open question. And again, it might be subtypes of the disorder in which GI gastrointestinal disruptions are a big problem in which you want to, it's worthwhile trying different special diets. So at this point, there isn't a recommendation from a dietary standpoint that family can take to sort of help with some of these synaptic issues. There's not, there's not an approach that's ready now for somebody to see if that could be helpful. Correct. As far as I know, at this point, the GI problems and the brain synaptic problems have not been clearly related, although there is ongoing research about that, that question. Okay. And I want to go back to something that you brought up in the presentation and, and now in the question and answers, which is that the, the findings ultimately will be that what we're now calling autism and autism spectrum, spectrum disorders probably isn't just one illness, that there's a number of subtypes of that. I'd like to just say a little bit more about that important issue. Yes, it is such an important issue. At this point, uh, you know, people talk about cancer versus cancers, plural, that there are many different types of cancer, all caused by different mutations or environmental problems or unknown problems with different presentations and different treatments. The same is probably true for autism. We should probably be talking about autisms, plural. Um, there's so many different types of autism, so, many, so much variability in the symptoms. Uh, in fact, this is what struck me at the very beginning when I started interacting with the clinical researchers, that the, the uh, aphorism right now is if you've seen one child with autism, you've seen one child with autism. Right. The next one will right. be different. The next one will be different. Um, so this kind of stratification into subgroups may turn out to be very helpful, both in terms of understanding causes and in terms of developing treatments specific to that subgroup. Well, our time is just about up, Jackie. I want to, again, say thank you. Um, your presentation was outstanding, and more importantly, the work that you're doing really gives hope that in the course of people's um, lives, there will be new developments that could really have an impact and make a difference for them. And uh, I thank you so much for the work that you're doing toward that. Um, well, thank you, Jeff, and I appreciate the interactions with the audience. Good, good, thank you. I also want to thank our audience as well um, for, for joining us. Uh, all of the research we fund is made possible through private donations. And if you'd like to make a donation, please visit bbrfoundation.org or call 1-800-829-8289. The webinar has been recorded. If you've missed any portion of the presentation or would like to share it with a family member or a friend, visit the webinar page at our website. Finally, I hope you'll join us again next month when Dr. Francisco Xavier Castellanos a 2015 recipient of the Foundation's Ruain Prize for Outstanding Achievement in Child and Adolescent Psychiatric Research, and a, tw and a 2005 Foundation grantee um, will be making a presentation entitled Living Well with ADHD, Scientific Guideposts to Improved Outcomes. This will take place on Tuesday, September 13th at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. I want to again say thank you for joining us and enjoy the rest of the day. Take care, everybody.